Good morning and welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 19th of January and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 22nd of January with me Michael Houston. It's certainly been quite a week for equity markets in general, fairly choppy. Um, got off to a poor start. European markets posted three successive daily declines um, in the wake of obviously the pre-Christmas euphoria, what was perceived as a December rate pivot from the Federal Reserve. FTSE 100 even had its worst day since August, sliding to its lowest level since late November um, on the Wednesday. Um, since then, we've seen a modest recovery, not only in Europe, but US markets have outperformed the NASDAQ 100, posting another record high. And I think if we could sum up this week, I think it's really central bankers have reset the narrative around rate cut timings. And that's certainly no better borne out than in the performance in the bond market. If we look at German two-year yields, they've rallied quite strongly from levels of around about 2.5% at the end of last week to be currently 18 to 19 basis points higher. This week, we've heard from the likes of the Bundesbank's Jochen Nagel, Austria's Robert Holtzman, and ECD, ECB President Christine Lagarde. And all, all of them have pushed back on the idea of an early rate cut, although Lagarde did hold open the possibility of a summer rate reduction as she looked to keep the doves on the side. And there are doves on the ECB governing council. And it's not hard to see why when you look at goods price inflation, which is very much in deflationary territory. But it's not goods price inflation that central bankers are concerned about at this point in time, hence the reluctance of them, I think, to um, pander to market expectations of a March rate cut. And I think that's what's really, I think, driven the volatility that we've seen so far this week. No one is disputing that we will see rate cuts this year. I think it's really the timings of those rate cuts. And that's what's seen a market reset. We've certainly seen it in the US two-year yield as well, which, seen as, which has seen a sharp rebound from the lows of last week when we were around about 14.14, we're now at 4.35. So again, 20 basis points has been priced out of the two-year. If we look at the UK gilt, a slightly more modest repricing after those shocking retail sales numbers this morning, um, minus 3.2% decline in UK retail sales in December. Now, November was revised slightly higher, 1.4%. But what does that, that number tell us? It tells us that an awful lot of consumers got in early when it, come, when it came to um, spending for Christmas with the various Black Friday deals discounting that we saw in November. And the bad weather in December, the rail strikes at the beginning of the month, obviously tempered some of the spending that we saw in that month, in that month, which was also a very wet month. Nonetheless, I don't think anything has changed in terms of the trajectory when it comes to the possibility of lower rates heading into 2024. I think the bigger question is when we start to see that first cut, because when we start to see that first cut, markets will be very, very much of the mindset is how many more are coming after that. And I think that is what is tempering, I think, central bankers in terms of they don't want to guide the market too early because we've seen what happens when that happens. And certainly if we look at where gilts were, gilt yields were, um, in the summer, we're still 125 basis points off those highs. So there's still a significant easing of monetary policy when it comes to mortgage rates and when it comes to overall rates, even though the base rate is still at 5.25%. We haven't seen such a big um, decline in German bonds yields, German two-year bond yields or the Schatz, but nonetheless, we have still seen a significant repricing there, and we've seen a significant repricing in the US. For me, I think if we look at the inflation numbers, we look at the inflation, num the, the wages numbers and the inflation numbers this week, 
the UK still has an inflation problem. Services CPI is at 6.1%, wages is at 66 Yes, they are slowing. But ultimately, I think if you're look, if you're the Bank of England and you were slow to tighten on the way in, you're probably going to be slow to ease on the way out. So I don't see the Bank of England cutting rates much before May of this year. Now, the ECB, on the other hand, the data could prompt them to cut sooner. Certainly, the hawkishness that we've seen this week would appear to suggest that they're in no rush. I would argue that they may be forced into an earlier cut. And I still think of all the central banks, the ECB will probably cut first. Federal Reserve, again, the data doesn't really support a rate cut. You look at the weekly jobless claims that we saw this week, 187,000, lowest number since September 2022. You know, the, the, the Federal Reserve does have slightly more flexibility in terms of the economic numbers. Um, what else have we seen this week? Weak China data. Retail sales were disappointing. Fourth quarter GDP. I mean, does anyone really believe those numbers? I don't. But certainly I think what we do know from the numbers that we saw out of China this week is the economy is struggling and we could see stimulus there. What we have seen do well this week is the Nikkei 225. And that's quite timely in the context of what's coming up next week. We've got a Bank of Japan rate decision. Now, dollar yen is something that I haven't really got a good track record of over the course of the past 12 months. This time a year ago, I was expecting to see dollar yen a lot lower. Hasn't really turned out the way I had hoped, but I'm not the only one. You know what they say, misery loves company. But um, nonetheless, um, dollar yen again. Will the Bank of Eng will, will the Bank of Japan tighten monetary policy this year? Probably. Well, but they're not going to be tightening it by much. The the their their benchmark rate is minus 0.1 percent. That we could see it move back into positive territory, but we're talking very very small steps here. And that's what is supporting the Nikkei. The Nikkei has hit a 34 year high this week and could well retest those record highs back in 1990 of 38,957. We're not close to that yet, but certainly if we go all the way back, um, my chart here only goes back to uh, the mid 90s, but the, it, the record high is all the way back in 1989-1990 and that's 38.957 and I see no reason on current momentum why we can't continue to push higher because I think next week's Bank of Japan rate decision is likely to be a damp squib. Since November the Japanese 10-year JGB has seen yields fall from a peak of 0.97 to fall below 0.6 percent at the start of this year. In fact, if I just look at the Japanese 10 year now on my Bloomberg, we'll get a better idea of where it is. Uh, 10 year JGB, where are you? Pull that up. There we go. It's right here. Got a line chart. So we've seen a fairly decent rebound in the past couple of days from those lows around about 0.55. It's probably not going to go below 0.5 because that was the previous um, cap on the yield curve control. And now it's probably going to trade between 0.5 and 1% and could well edge back towards 0.75 if the Bank of Japan keeps its options open about um, tightening policy going forward. They're certainly not offering much in the way of guidance as to their future intentions. Uh, on the two year, we're back at 0%, having been as high as 0.15. So I think we could see a modest rebound. Is that going to undermine what we're seeing with respect to the Nikkei? Unlikely. I, I still think there's potential for further upside there just on the basis of a slightly weaker yen. And that's certainly what we've seen so far this week. The dollar yen has moved back through our cloud resistance and as well as the 50-day moving average. This area is now likely to act as a little bit of support. We're running into a little bit of um, thin air up around 148.80. But certainly I think this area around about 146.50 
should act as a support going forward. We do look a little bit stretched and also 150 is going to be a fairly decent barrier. So we could probably trade 145, 150 on dollar yen for the foreseeable future. Certainly the trend on that does appear to be for a higher dollar and a weaker yen. Um, if we look at um, the FTSE 100 this week, we can see the damage done over the course of the past few days. I think we could well stabilize. We've, bro we've broken this uptrend line here, but what was important was we didn't take out those lows back in November. Uh, so 7,400 likely to act as a little bit of support. I'm going to remove that line now. Don't need it. But um, again, these two moving averages here could act as a little bit of resistance on the way up. But I, yeah, I think what we what we can say is we're still very much range bound when it comes to the FTSE 100. So there's not really too much to get excited about there. So it's still a still very much a range trade. German DAX seeing a little bit of a pullback from the highs back in December. We did trade below these lows here, found support the 50 day moving average. The next key resistance is going to be this trend line here, but also these peaks that we saw back at the beginning of the month in January at around about 16,840. So we really need to push through the 16,800 area to suggest a revisit of the record highs of back in December. So certainly keep an eye on that, but still, I don't think there's much um, much to get excited about. It's still very much playing the range when it comes to the German DAX. NASDAQ, record highs this week, or in the past couple of days, after a pretty uh, choppy start to the week. We've seen an awful, we've got long shadows on these candles, which suggests that markets really haven't got a clear idea of where they want to take the market. Yes, we saw that strong breakout yesterday on the back of the Magnificent Seven. Um, Taiwan Semiconductors uh, revised up their guidance for 2024, targeting 20% plus increase in full year revenue. On the base of, on the basis of AI chip sales, um, that pushed Nvidia and advanced micro devices AMD up to new record highs, and it looks to me as if the Nasdaq is going to continue to push higher towards so 17,000 to 100 in the short term and potentially even higher. Um, certainly, the 50-day moving average looks a fairly decent area to look at buying dips on that particular market. S&P 500 retesting the record highs of back in 2022. It continues to want to flirt with that particular 4820 area. Bigger question is, does it have the momentum on this occasion to take that level out? Hard to say, given that it's a fairly small cohort of markets or stocks that's driving this rally higher. If we look at, say, for example, the Dow Jones, um, the gains have been slightly more tempered. What I think has been important, as far as the Dow is concerned, there's fairly decent support in and around this 36,950 area, 37,000 area. So that's certainly worth keeping an eye out for over the course of the next few days. So as we look ahead um, to the week ahead, we've got another central bank decision, which I think is going to be fairly interesting, given some of the commentary that's come out of Davos this week from the likes of Lagarde, Holtzman, Nagel, Villaroy, and all the other uh, minor players in the ECB. Um, we've got the ECB rate decision on the 25th. And when you look at the economic performance of Europe, you sort of look at it and think, surely they've got to be cutting rates at some point. We certainly haven't seen anything in the way of growth since the third quarter of 2022. That's right, 2020, 2022, not 2023, 2022. Inflation has been slowing sharply, yet for all this economic weakness, the ECB has been insistent it is not close to considering a cut in rates, having hiked as recently as last September. In November, headline CPI, slow to 2.4%, but it has picked up again since then to 2.9%. Core prices are at 3.4%. So 
while the rebound in headline inflation is no doubt been driven by base effects and will be used as evidence by the hawks that um, rates need to stay high, we're already seeing some evidence that the consensus about rates where they are is starting to diverge, shall we say. So while we can expect no more rate hikes, um, the economic data certainly supports the idea of a cut sooner rather than later. I think the bigger question is whether it comes before June, um, given the pushback that we've seen this week. Now, obviously, we've also seen the market reprice um, Fed rate cuts uh, this year as well. And the market was pricing six rate cuts from the Federal Reserve, um, which which yeah, so quite it's farcical. And Christopher Waller reset that narrative earlier this week with his comments. Um, I think it was Wednesday uh, when he was talking about the need to be cautious when it comes to cutting rates and saw no, so, saw no need to rush in to rate cuts. So I think that has also helped reset the market expectations on that. So let's look at euro dollar. Euro dollar has found support two days in a row at around about 108.40 also coincides with the 200 day moving average. So I think that's going to be a fairly decent area of support. I've talked about that in my daily updates, 108, 30, 40. If we can hold above that, then the, we could well start to edge back towards 109, 40 and 110. But there's not really that much to get excited about. And we are still pretty much in the broader uptrend that we've been in since those October lows. So I see no reason to change my view that Euro dollar is likely to be very much a case of buying the dips. Similarly, on cable, now you can argue that this could be or does appear to be forming some form of topping pattern. Um, we've got three sets of highs at 128, but we've also got three sets of lows at 125, 90, 126. So it's really a question of playing that. Um, I think if you get a break below the 50 day moving average here and 125.80, and you could see a little bit of selling all the way back to 124 and a half. But overall, this again looks pretty much a range trade. And let's not forget that while we've got the ECB and the Bank of Japan next week, we've got the um, Bank of England and the Federal Reserve the week after. So it'll be very interesting in the context, as far as the Bank of England is concerned, what their forecasts are for inflation and uh, GDP going forward for the rest of 2024 when they publish the February projections for the UK economy. But certainly based on the data, rate cuts for the Bank of England could come in June, but at the moment the market is pricing sometime in August. That is actually having a fairly um, decent uh, effect on Euro sterling. Euro sterling is weaker, but again, We've broken this trend line here, but we haven't been able to take out those lows down there. So again, this appears to be very much a range trade and probably will continue to be so. So we're looking 84, 85, 85, 50, 85, 40, 85.30 on the downside, 86, 87 on the upside, very much playing the range on Euro Sterling. We've also got next week US fourth quarter GDP. And while the UK consumer is on its knees, given those retail sales numbers that we saw this morning, there they are, right over here, right there. Um, the US consumer, on the other hand, is looking much more resilient. And retail sales spending did pick up towards the end of last year after a week October. And consequently, I think this week's Q4 personal consumption number because we've also got US core PCE. So that's going to be very in that's going to be, I think, instructive in terms of the debate about a March rate cut, which I think is pretty much done. You know, we're not getting it. It's not going to happen. And I think core PCE is likely for December is unlikely to shed too much light on that. But fourth quarter GDP might. That's been revised up in the past few days. We're expected to see something in the region of about two percent. It was revised up from one and a half percent, which, you know, while it would be the weakest quarter of 2023, it certainly wouldn't be by much. So um, the resilience of the US consumer likely to give a boost to the personal consumption 
of US GDP and likely to um, keep prices, while slightly weaker, um, still around to two and a half percent for US fourth quarter GDP. On the earnings front, we're really starting to kick into gear now in the wake of the earnings numbers that we saw from the US bank. Um, we've got not only have we got um, Netflix and Tesla, but the week after we'll start to get the big guns of Microsoft as well. So um, next few days, next few weeks are likely to be key in the context of uh, US earnings. Looking at Netflix, seen a really strong rally over the course of the past uh, couple of years. If we look at the daily chart and the rallies, that was the rebound um, back in October uh, when they when they published the Q3 numbers. And fears that the crackdown and password sharing haven't really prompted a slowdown in um, subscriber numbers. We saw Q3 subscribers surged to 8.76 million. The ads business has done really well. Free cash flow uh, rose to $1.89 billion. Obviously, payment for new content um, was lower due to the writers and actors strike. And actually, what they did do um, in Q3 was start to hedge um, or announce a hedging program given that 60% of their revenue was non-US dollar based and likely to increase over time. So that's welcome. So that should help boost profits if it's done correctly. Um, Q4, Netflix says it expects to see revenues of 8.7 billion, um, a rise of 11%, with net additions in line with Q3. Profits expected to come in at $2.15 a share, which will be a big increase on the 12 cents a share from the same quarter last year. This is due to the lowest spending content, um, which has helped improve cash flow. So it does appear to be resistance up here at around about 505. If we can break above 510, we should well, we could well see further gains going forward. I think the big one, and this is the one I'm particularly interested in, is Tesla, because that is looking a little bit weak um, on the price action front. We are starting to run out a little bit of steam after the really strong rally from the 2022 lows been trading sideways pretty much for the most of the last six months and did fall to five months lows in the aftermath of its q3 numbers back in october it is selling more cars than ever before sold 440 484,500 in um, its most recent quarter in, in q4 most of these being the Model 3 and the Model Y. Um, but in China, it's having its, it's basically having its lunch eaten by BYD. They managed to sell 526,000 vehicles over the same quarter. So uh, operating expenses is going to be the key factor here, as well as margins, um, given the price cuts that they've announced not only in China, but also in Europe. And I think that is going to be a key component going forward. Total automotive revenues have been rising, but the main growth area has been its has, has been its energy generation business, which has seen revenues increase over time. Albeit it's only one point it was only $1.56 billion um, in Q3. Margins a year ago were 7.2%, 17. 17.2%. There's 7.6% now. So that's going to be a very key area going forward. How much impact is Tesla going to have to take on margins to try and shift the same number of vehicles? It sold 1.8 million vehicles last year, and Musk will be hoping to sell and hit that 2 million barrier in fairly short order. The only question is at what expense will it be when it comes to its margins. So I think that's going to be the key area for Tesla. Um, consensus forecast for Q4 revenues are in the region of around about $25.6 billion. So um, what are their projections going forward? Obviously, we've seen or we've heard about the shutdown of the Berlin factory for two weeks due to a lack of parts caused by the disruption in the Red Sea. 
So that could impact um, revenues in Q1 and deliveries in Q1. Annual revenues expected to come in at $97.3 billion. Okay, listen, I've rambled on long enough. So I think we can pretty much say that's pretty much it for this week. Once again, thanks very much for listening. Hope you all have a great weekend. Stay warm, stay dry. Speak to you all same time, same place next week. Thank you very much for listening.